Welcome to today's webinar with the topic, is Nelson Mandela's legacy still significant for today's South Africa? It is a cooperation event between the Afro-Asian Institute Salzburg and the Southern Africa Documentation and Cooperation Center, short ZADOC, in Vienna. My name is Marcel Singal. I'm from the Afro-Asian Institute in Salzburg. Today's moderator are Margit Maximilian, long time specializing on Africa and worked for a long time for the Austrian Public TV, and Walter Sauer, the chairman of Zadok in Vienna. Um, let me briefly, before I hand over to our today's moderator, let me give me a technical overview. We have planned that this webinar will take about half an hour. We will give input from our interview partners for the first hour and then have time for half an hour of discussion. It is important to note that this webinar is recorded and will be published. If you don't like to be in the recording, you can turn off your camera. It's easy to participate with video. It can be switched on at the bottom on the left side. It is great to be there with camera because our discussion will be much livelier. The microphone is deactivated during the input, but during the discussion, the microphone can be activated. The chat window, you can use it all the time and questions which come up during the session can be also used in the discussion. If you have a technical issue, please also use the chat window. There you can also write me a personal message and we will try to solve your issue. So I wish you all an exciting webinar and I hand now over to Margit and Walter. Uh, thank you very much, Marcel for this uh, brief technical introduction. Um, our topic this afternoon is, uh, is Nelson Mandela's legacy and leadership still relevant or significant for South Africa? And before we go into that, I would like to make an, an, a general and initial remark, and, which is actually a very sad one. Uh, I would like on behalf of uh, the organizers to express our condolences uh, with regard to the passing away of Sinzi Mandela, uh, the youngest daughter of Madiba. Uh, we were shocked actually, she died at a relatively young age, 59 years. Um, and we think it will be, it was, it is being a great shock to many people in South Africa and beyond. So please allow me to ex extend our con condolences to the family and friends of Sinzi Mandela, but also to the South African people at large. Uh, this webinar takes place among a lot of challenges uh, to the world actually but to South Africa in particular. And some of those challenges also affects, affect our webinar. And I would like to hand over to Margit Maximilian uh, to explain a little bit what the challenge for us now in this hour or one hour and a half uh, are and will be. Yes, thank you, Walter. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, first, I would start to, to give a brief um, uh, introduction to the panelists, but this is a bit complicated today because uh, just a few hours ago, we um, were not sure who would be able to attend. South Africa is experiencing um, long power cuts again, and um, so this creates a big uncertainty for today's discussion also, but I'm, I'm happy uh, that you are here and I hope the light will not go off. And uh, we will also later on have a chance, uh, hopefully, to welcome Barbara Hogan. So I won't be the only woman in this webinar. Um, so let alone uh, the little problems, um, much more I'm glad to welcome and introduce first uh, Derek uh, Hanekon. Welcome. Derek is um, undoubtedly one of the best experts of South African uh, politics. He has good contacts with Austria and with uh, SADOC since uh, many years. 
he was an ANC underground activist once during the apartheid years. And uh, together with his wife, he was an important figure um, in the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, he was sentenced to three years in prison, charged with treason, like Mandela himself. Um, under the then Mandela administration, he served five years as a minister of agriculture and um, land affairs. Until uh, last year, Derek Hanekom was minister of tourism. Um, before he made big headlines because um, he challenged former president Jacob Zuma with a vote of no confidence within the ANC leadership. And uh, surprisingly, I would say he won and uh, Zuma had to apologize, right? <laughs> uh, right, Derek? <laughs> okay. And um, secondly, um, uh, Jody Kolapan, um, he's a lawyer and a famous, famous, very famous judge in, at the High Court of South Africa, specialized particularly on human rights. Uh, he served as a commissioner of the South African uh, Human Rights Commission and worked on important cases like the Sharpeville well Six. Justice Kolopan has previously uh, served also as a lecturer at the University of Pretoria and uh, moreover, he serves on the board of uh, many civil society organizations. So this is uh, basically the two main participants at the moment. Walter, who will come, do you think? Yeah, I, I, this is the more difficult part, part now <laughs> because I have to introduce people who are not here. Uh, and uh, because of these power uh, problems in South Africa. Uh, the first one is Barbara Hogan. Uh, who would have liked to be with us and if electricity is restored in time, uh, would join in a bit later. Barbara Hogan was actually the first woman in South Africa who was um, sentenced to imprisonment because of high treason. Uh, and um, after, of course, liberation, uh, she was very active in the ANC. Uh, as she was then um, nominated Minister for Health uh, by President Motlante and she was very, she earned her merits uh, in changing the controversial AIDS, HIV AIDS policy South Africa had uh, uh, before. Uh, and she later was then Minister uh, of um, Public, uh, what is it, Public Corporations Public enterprises. enterprises. Public enterprises, sorry for that, uh, which was also a very important uh, ministry and uh, um, which brought her into conflict with the president of the time and then she had to leave government as uh, Derek Hanekom had to leave. Uh, Barbara Hogan, as I said, uh, will join if, if it is possible for her. The other one is Horst Kleinschmidt. Uh, Horst Kleinschmidt might be known to some of us, he is a frequent visitor to Austria. Um, a host um, had to go into exile at, a, at, a, at an early stage because of his underground activities. He was uh, based in London for many years as the director of the International Defense and Aid Fund, uh, supporting political prisoners, actually paying the fees for lawyers uh, to defend political prisoners. Um, after 1990, actually 1991, Horst Kleinschmidt uh, was awarded the Austrian uh, Bruno Kreisky Human Rights Award. And I, I use this opportunity to express my personal opinion and my personal hope uh, that uh, he will at some stage be decorated with a South African award as well. Uh, Horst Kleinschmidt was um, a, 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 an active, he was director of some uh, organizations, NGOs in the development field. And in the year 2000, he was um, asked by uh, President Mbeki uh, to become 
uh, Deputy Director General in the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, particularly responsible for fisheries. And he changed the fisheries policy of South Africa uh, to a large extent and was then afforded, uh, uh, was then afforded a, a prize for, for black economic empowerment for his activity in, in the fisheries industry. So Horst Kleinschmidt sent us a video message because he is also affected by the power cuts. We will play that later. If, uh, if electricity is restored in time, he will try to join in later. But at least we have his uh, video message. So by that, I hand over back to Margit. Yes, thank you. So um, I know to get some kind of red line in our discussion today, Walter asked you to hold, um, to, to think of one example for the significance of uh, Mandela's leadership for South Africa today. Um, and of course, I would like to start exactly with this. Uh, questions, what significance is there? We know um, a majority of uh, South Africans were not alive, alive during the Mandela years and these born free nowadays see Mandela much more critical. Uh, he, they they um, argue that he maybe gave in too quickly. Uh, I experienced uh, all this um, when I asked people on the streets. Um, so that's the question, but before, um, I know it, it's, it's not, a, it, it shouldn't be on the agenda, but there is a word. Um, we are all very bored to hear in these days and months, and of course this is Corona. I did some stories for the radio, and, and uh, I know um, in so South Africa is really in the, in the middle of the storm in these days. Uh, so, so many people are infected. No alcohol, no cigarettes, no jobs, uh, sometimes even no food. Uh, can you, if I start with Derek, can you just reflect uh, one minute uh, how, this, how is the state of the country? Uh, can South Africa survive all this? Uh, is, the, is the government doing enough uh, to mitigate the problems of these people? Uh, thanks, thanks for the question and Grüß um, Gott um, alle Österreicher and uh, greetings to all of the non-Austrians who are part of the webinar. Um, it, yours is quite a loaded question because there was a build up to your question and um, um, of course we, we're right in the grips of um, this very serious pandemic. Uh, a couple of, and the changes all the time, a couple of months ago we, we felt very confident that we were escaping the worst of it. Um, that the, the measures that were introduced were very widely welcomed by South Africans. They were fairly drastic at early stage, although um, the public was explained by scientists, and we have some excellent scientists who are epidemiologists or virologists, etc., who were engaging with the public on television, explaining the nature of the virus, the pandemic, what has to be done and what should be avoided, and what the possible uh, scenario were. And I mean, he made it very clear that it's going to hit South Africa and it's going to hit it hard, but that it's, that it's very necessary to delay the, the onset. And mm. so that was done quite successfully, uh, but, but sooner or later it had to hit. And I think it's hit us, and I'm sure Jody will, will agree, hit us a lot harder than even the most pessimistic of us mm. would have expected. Um, so we now are in the, in, virtually in the top five in terms of active cases and the in the world and in terms of the daily new cases i think we are something like number three in the world which is which is very serious so and of course there's none of us uh, um, do not know somebody who's uh, who's affected infected or has died of the virus so it, it is, it's hitting us rather hard but you know I, I need to take that and and talk about a little bit about your, your earlier question, what, you know, what, you know, what do we do in times of crisis? Do we, do, will we get through this crisis? The answer is yes. Um, and the world will get through this crisis. Uh, when and, and, and what the toll is going to be, none of us know. But um, you know, I certainly don't think it's going to be as bad as the Spanish flu in uh, 1918 or something like that. Um, I think that there are lots of medical advances. But the big thing, and I'm telling you all uh, stuff that you know, 
um, the uh, introduction of a vaccine or the development of, a, of an effective vaccine will obviously make a critical difference. But right now, the focus in South Africa has to be on um, human behavior, societal behavior, doing the right things. And it's difficult in a country like ours, a lot more difficult, I dare say, than Austria, Switzerland, and most European countries for a variety of reasons. So it's not easy. And then finding the balance between the necessary measures in order to protect lives and, and opening up the economy for, you know, the stimu for livelihoods and, and jobs. And so while, you know, not everyone is getting coronavirus, millions of people are, you know, losing their jobs, losing their livelihoods, and, and hunger is a, is a very pressing reality in our country at the moment. So people are quite desperate, and it's always difficult to find the, the right balance between opening up and make sure and, and doing your best to ensure that the, the virus is contained. That's where we are at the moment. But, you know, we are a resilient country. You know, we've, we've, we've gone through many crises, and uh, we'll go through this one as well. By and large, the South African public in the earliest stage, you know, there was, there was a lot of consensus, a lot of unity around it. And, and then as measures are introduced that are uh, inconvenient or uncomfortable, banning the sale of cigarettes, et cetera, you have lobby groups emerging who are disgruntled and unhappy, and, and there's never a single answer. So wh whatever you do, there'll be different, uh, a range of opinions. Um, the good thing about South Africa is that, you know, we uh, debate these things in a robust fashion, very openly. Um, and there, there is leadership. Your question was, is the government doing enough? There's, you know, we, we will necessarily, and Jody will, would, would have his own views. We would necessarily and inevitably not all agree with all of government's measures. But by and large, uh, government has taken this very seriously. And there's been good leadership. And I think the whole topic of this webinar is what kind of leadership do we need at the moment? How do we draw inspiration from the kind of leadership that Nelson Mandela provided? There's good leadership from our president. Sometimes some of us, many of us think that some of our ministers who are sort of the next layer, if you like, um, do things that we don't agree with. And in fact, do things that are inappropriate. Um, so. Uh, you know, it's it's layers of leadership that you require. It's not a single leadership figure, um, but but by and large, the um, the responses are correct and and mostly the public supported. How do you measure that? Well, interestingly, in an opinion poll on the president himself and and the confidence level in the president um, is is at the moment in our country and this is a recent opinion poll is running very very high. So they feel that he is providing the kind of leadership that is needed in a time of crisis like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, then maybe uh, Jody, do you agree? Is it uh, um, good leadership? It's all fine? Well, look, I, I largely agree with, with Derek. Um, many of us didn't anticipate we'd be in this position when it was uh, estimated that we'd be having in excess of 10,000 infections a day. We almost said that's impossible. Um, but the reality is that as South Africans, we, we may be equally vulnerable to the virus, but our ability to deal with it and to overcome it is, is different in where we're situated. And the impact of the virus on, on the poor and on the vulnerable has been particularly devastating. You, you just need to drive along the streets to see the large numbers of people um, who are on the streets looking for food, trying to get a job, just trying to survive and get through this. And those of us in my position, and may I say Derek's position, are in a more fortunate position because we have the resources and the means to overcome it. So I agree that we will overcome it, but I, I think that when we are able to return to normality, we have to take stock of where we're at. Uh, and there may be the need for further policy interventions on the part of government to prevent people from losing their homes, from preventing people from losing their possessions, from providing greater social relief, and, and much has been done already. So, so that is, um, in a sense, um, a, a future that we, we need to plan for and prepare for. What's also difficult about the virus is the changing science about it and the debates that we have in our society. So in the early stages of the virus, schools were immediately shut down because it was thought that 
that would be a incubation ground for the virus. But now as new science becomes available, we are told that children are less likely to be infected and that children are extremely low transmitters of the virus. And so we see the reopening of schools. But we've also seen enormous challenges and, and the constitution and the legal framework has been tested. On the one hand, groups have come to court seeking to um, take us back to stricter lockdowns uh, on the basis that by opening up the economy, government is placing profits above people. On the other hand, there are other groups who've challenged the lockdown regulations and indeed the state of disaster on the basis that it is an unwarranted and unnecessary interference, as it were, in the rights of people. And I have had to sit in court cases in the last three weeks dealing with, with these difficult issues. And the answers are not so easy because mm. the science and the facts are, are continuously changing. And so there's a fair amount of deference, if I may say, on the part of the courts as well to say, well, we, we're not equipped as judges to make these calls. And, and government is there, government is being advised by a group of eminent scientists and let them make the calls in, in the knowledge that some of those calls may, may not always be right. But I think if it's done with integrity and good faith, and I think that is the basis on which it is being done, then government is in this difficult position of striking the necessary balance in terms of protecting uh, people, but at the same time, in terms of trying to mitigate the impact of COVID uh, going forward. But lastly, just on this point, I think we also see the many years of neglect uh, by state administration in our ability to deal with the virus. The state of our healthcare system, the state of public administration leaves much to be desired. And, and one simply expresses the hope that if we were more diligent in how we managed our country in the last 20 years, uh, our ability now to be more resilient in dealing with the effects of this virus would have been enhanced. It's simply unacceptable that you, you have hospitals that are dysfunctional, uh, not because of a want of resources, but because of a waste of resources. And then again, it's the poor and the vulnerable who are at the receiving end of this because middle class people have their medical, private medical, and they can go to well equipped hospitals. So in, in a sense, the effect of the virus is also uh, largely being played out against many years of, of neglect. Uh, in, in our country, yeah. Yeah, that's, exactly, I, yeah, I, that's I, exactly what I wanted to ask because we are talking about the significance of uh, Mandela today, but you had eight years uh, with Suma and uh, where, where are we standing now? Um, that's the question. Okay, I indicated to Walter that I, I have to be quite uh, careful in terms of my remarks today. Uh, as a sitting judge. So yeah. I, I don't want to be expressing mm -hmm. views that bring the judiciary into disrepute or may prejudge. Uh, but I, I think the leadership of, of Mandela uh, is needed now and necessary now even more so. And in saying that, I'm, I'm mindful that the South Africa of 2020 is considerably different from the South Africa of 1994. In 1994, we were euphoric we achieved this enormous victory, uh, overcoming the horrors of apartheid and putting in place the foundations of a democratic system of government that would provide for our people. But in the last 25 years, obviously, we've, we've I suppose, been less romantic and become more realistic. We've quantified the damage caused by apartheid. We've come to realize how difficult it is to give effect to the promise of the constitution and we deal with those problems on a daily basis and people at some level are disillusioned and understandably so. But it's, it's that leadership, that leadership that is located in a kind of moral stature, the ability to um, speak above party lines and bring unity to the country and take people along with the leadership irrespective of their political affiliations that is needed now more than ever. And I'd like to say that we, we are able to begin to see the seeds of that new leadership taking root. And, and that's, that's absolutely encouraging. But also the, the other legacy of, of Mandela in the rule of law and the importance of institutions of state, including the courts, is an important one, which I think continues to endure. You will recall that 
even when South African courts made findings against him in his capacity of head of state, and even when he disagreed with those findings, he nevertheless took the view that for this democracy to succeed, I as head of state have to respect those findings. I can take it on appeal, but ultimately when the last court has spoken, I must conform to those findings and to those orders. And I think that legacy largely continues because even today, and even though we have what is called, uh, I mean, people use the courts perhaps too much in my view, the respect for court orders and the respect for the, the, the system of government that is put in place uh, remains largely intact. And, and I think that is part of that wonderful legacy that he's left us, but that we dare not take for granted. Uh, it's so easy to, to begin to slip down this, this, this slope. Uh, and so in, in that respect, uh, I think, uh, and I, I don't want to speak about the last 10 years, but I speak about the current uh, position is that uh, S South Africans are beginning to, to find a sense of comfort and confidence uh, in the leadership. Certainly as, as a South African myself, uh, I, I feel confident about my country, about my, my government and about its ability, despite considerable obstacles, to take us past these difficult times. And it's not going to be easy and there might be blood on the floor, uh, but, but I believe we will get there. Even if the economy is going down even more and more, there's 7% recession now. You think we're... Well, the, the economy was, was in a bad shape even before the, the advent of COVID-19. And, and I think therein lies a major challenge as well, because I think one of the deficits we face in our society is that the idea of, of social cohesion, something that, that former President Mandela advanced strongly, where he advocated that, that our freedom and our liberty will not be complete unless people are lifted out of poverty and able to live a life of dignity has not happened. And it's not happened just not because of the poor economic situation we find ourselves in, but I think it's not happened because by and large in the last 20 years, South Africans have largely adopted this attitude that, well, we've fought the good struggle and now it's about what, what is in this democracy for me. So we've seen enormous growth in wealth on the part of some, and for others, a deepening of their poverty and their vulnerability. And, and I think that part of the Mandela legacy is something that we need to find ways of, of, of resuscitating and reconnecting with, because the, the kind of divide that exists in our society today uh, can't be good for the, the, the democracy we've put in place. I personally don't think that we can sustain a democracy in the face of the kind of inequalities that exist in our society. So yes, we have challenges and not all of them must be laid at the door of government. We need to each ask ourselves as a citizen of this country, uh, myself as Jody Collipin, someone who has been able to, in, in the last 20 years, advance considerably in terms of my own career, in terms of my own life, because I live in a democratic society. What is it that I put back into the society? How do I ensure that my own future trajectory is, is linked to, to that of the millions of people who live in this country? And it's easy to articulate that, but, but not so much easy to put it into practice. And I, see, I think we see so many South Africans who've done remarkably well uh, at the expense of, of so many others. And I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who, who once said that perhaps, you know, the, the rich, uh, need to live more simply so that the poor can simply live. And, and that's not something that we've internalized in South Africa. Maita, you want to, Maita? I, we don't, I don't hear you. It's unmute. Yeah, I yeah. should be unmuted actually. Now it's can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. No, I was saying that uh, Jody Collapen raised a number of important points and maybe it would be interesting to hear Derek Honeycomb's uh, assessment on, on Mandela's legacy and whether you share some of the critical points raised 
or have other points which you want to, to make before we bring in uh, Horst Kleinsch with the, with the pre-recorded message. Okay. Do you want me to come in if, now? If, if it's okay, yes, yes, yes please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've, I've been listening to Jody very carefully and clearly, I mean, he's, he's expressed the, the, the real situation and, and, and articulated some of the challenges we face in our country very well. And I agree with everything that he says. Um, um, he expresses some kind of confidence in government. Um, I think most of us even have confidence in our judges even in Nikki, uh, although one or two of our judges have recently made some quite controversial, prominent judges made quite controversial statements and that brought them under some kind of public attack or, or public criticism. But that says a lot about South Africa. We, we're a lively democracy and that's a good mm -hmm. thing. Um, the um, difficult to, to know where to e even start, but I agree with Nikki that the, um, at the, at the moment, it's brought to the surface. This coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, has brought to the surface realities that were with us that are now much more acute, more acutely experienced, but they were with us. And the reality of very high, a very high level of unemployment in our country, which even during the years of economic growth, um, continued to grow. So more jobs were created, but numbers of unemployed people with growing populations, growing employable adults, the, the absolute numbers of unemployed people continue to grow. So we have a, a sort of unusually high level of unemployment, a very high level of unemployment for a country at our level of economic development. That's the one part of it. Then of course, um, high levels of poverty, pockets of, of serious underdevelopment, and then, then most importantly, the, the degree of inequality that we have in our society. And I think that, uh, so, so it's the, Poverty that is now, you know, being felt very harshly as the poverty is exacerbated by people losing their jobs and, and losing the bit of income that they had, despite measures, quite, quite extensive measures um, from the side of government to, to um, bring relief and to um, ameliorate that or to, to uh, um, you know, help in some way or other. The, um, the, the, the situation is, is, is very serious. But I think the inequality um, is something that has come to the surface more strongly than ever before. But, but on the question then of, 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 of what kind of leadership um, is required in, the, in, this sort of a, in this very challenging time. Uh, well, one is, it's, it's not just the leader, but society and in, in our case, the, the African National Congress as the, the governing party has to reflect very seriously on uh, you know, what have we not achieved and why haven't we achieved as much as we would have liked to have achieved over the last 25 years. So there's no doubt that 26 years into democracy, if you like, um, that many things are much, much better than they were then. So uh, a lot of positive change, uh, many things that uh, you know, would be broadly welcomed. Often people take things for granted. That's certainly um, because People have grown up with different, a different reality from the reality that existed pre-1994. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, things have also gone wrong in many respects. So it was nine years of Zuma rule where we should have been making um, considerable, we should have made considerable advances during that time. It doesn't mean that we didn't make any advances. Um, obviously, things carried on and there's still infrastructure development and there were many positive developments during that time, but there were a lot of negatives, negatives that held us back. Uh, there was looting on a massive scale, the growth, you know, if, if something became a, we, we often in South Africa, we speak about right now because of um, gender-based violence that is really rearing its ugly head in South Africa. People speak about the, including our president, about two pandemics, the coronavirus pandemic and the gender-based violence, violence pandemic, if you like. But, but we had a, a very serious problem, call it a, a pandemic, if you like, of, of growing corruption. Uh, and, and that corruption was starting to, and had started to entrench itself within the ruling party, within the African National Congress. And of course, it became per pervasive at all levels of government and in the private sector. So, you know, it became almost, 
uh, you know, it, not, not quite the order of the day. There are countries where, um, you know, corruption is, 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 is much more an everyday reality and an everyday experience, corruption and bribery than South Africa. But, you know, the, the, the big looting of the big state owned enterprises, big companies, etc., cetera, um, that affected our economy in a very serious way. Um, and, you know, there are lots of modeling, lots of um, estimates, but it, it cost us uh, literally hundreds of billions of rand, if not, if not trillions. And, yes. and the, the, the effect of that, that even though that, that you know, Zuma is no, happily no longer with us, uh, so we have a new, new leadership, but it doesn't mean that overnight all of the people that were guilty of corruption are no longer in those positions where they were able to do the corrupt things. Because that happened over a period of time, putting people into key positions where they were able to uh, carry out corrupt activities. Uh, then you, you have the, the change and the change had to come from the top because it was the top that was allowing the corruption, if you like, and then layers below. Uh, the change of the top doesn't mean that all the layers below are, are replaced. So, you know, that is the, the process at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm sure Jody will agree that some of the steps have been put in place. Uh, a very good national director of public prosecutions. So the investigations are happening. The, the will to prosecute is there, but the capacity is very limited. So the, um, you know, at the moment they're trying to strengthen their ability to bring those people who, are, who did these corrupt things in the past and uh, to book and to conduct a successful prosecutions. Um, they are determined that they're not, that they go to do these things properly. And so they want the cases that come to court to be court ready cases. So the process has begun. But the truth of the matter is that um, the rot of corruption set itself into our society and it's still happening. So it's not that it's, it's come to an end. So what kind of uh, leadership do you, lead, do you need? Well, to some extent, we've got it from the top. But when you talk leadership, you've got, you have to talk about layers of leadership. So, um, you know, we just don't have, uh, I think we'd be broad consensus other than those people who just protect the, the interests of their parties. There'd be broad consensus that, you know, the, 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 the kind of leadership at a broad level that is required to get ourselves out of the situation is insufficient, is lacking, if you like. And the leadership, it's not just in the ANC. Of course, the ANC has the greatest effect on our country because of it being the majority party and the party that is governing nationally and, and governing nine of our, eight of our nine provinces. But if you take some of the opposition parties, then you can see there are leadership crises in the opposition parties as well. Um, so leadership needs to be at the provincial level. We've got some, so it has to be said that there's some very good leaders amongst this reality of, of a, what some would call a leadership vacuum. I don't believe there's a vacuum, but I do believe there's a situation where on the one hand, you've got some very good leaders um, who are starting to address the problem and sometimes quite effectively and getting things moving. Um, I want to, I'll talk about the economy in a moment and how we get ourselves out of the economic crisis and what is happening to get ourselves out of the economic crisis. So there, there is good leadership. There's some premiers, you know, the, the, the governors of our provinces, if you like, who are providing very good leadership there. And there's some who are not providing the leadership that we would expect of them. And that's, that's the reality. We have a cabinet, many of whom are working extremely hard and doing good things. And there are others, uh, I dare say, uh, I'm no longer in cabinet, so I can speak quite freely, um, that, are, that really should not be in cabinet, quite frankly. Uh, but then, then the difference between, between Sora Ramaphosa, just before I get to the economy, uh, Sora Ramaphosa and Nelson Mandela. Well, firstly, we will never get another Nelson Mandela. It's just the way it is. I mean, he is just an extraordinary human being and, uh, you know, some, you know, almost beyond belief. Um, I had the, 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 the immense privilege of, of serving in the cabinet under him for a five year period and, and experiencing, you know, the, the, all, all those qualities, those leadership qualities that he provided. So it wasn't just, you know, um, being able to make decisions, it wasn't just his, his integrity and his, the kind of person he is. Obviously, the humility part of it, the ability to listen and listen very, very carefully. Listen and think very carefully before, before 
um, making decisions. Now, it doesn't mean that he was always that, that meticulous. There were times when he also shot his mouth off, you know, but, but in general, that's, that's what he was. He was a very careful listener, very good strategic thinker, and very good at getting people behind him once he made a decision. So the good fortune then, um, uh, under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, was that um, almost the entire country, although they didn't agree with uh, many of the policies of the African National Congress, almost the entire country loved the man. And he knew it was important for them to love him. And that came quite naturally to him. And not everybody is imbued with those kinds of qualities, frankly. So, you know, a little bit forward, and we get to Cyril Ramaphosa, who I've known for many, many years, and I have a very, very high level of confidence in him. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's faced with a very difficult job. Actually, Nelson Mandela saw him as a potential successor, even while uh, Nelson Mandela was president himself. He saw, saw Ramaphosa as a future president of the country. It took a long time to happen, but it eventually happened, and there's a different context. Another little thing about Nelson Mandela and the context, it wasn't him alone in terms of uh, a leadership layer. If you look at all of the Ravonia trialists and um, you know that group of people who were on Robben Island with him, Walter Sisulu, and um, you know, uh, um, the, the, you know them, and I can mention every one of them. The most most recently, Dennis Goldberg passed away, and before that, Ahmad Kathrada passed away. Um, I'm also very proudly a member of the Ahmad Kathrada Foundation. So, but but that was a layer of leadership of people that were really highly respected in society, uh, people with um, uh, you know you know, who, who were um, extraordinary people in their own right, every one of them. I should just say uh, that the um, Sheila Sisulu, the daughter-in-law of Walter Sisulu, was very keen to have joined us on the webinar today. Tonight, today. Uh, but unfortunately, she had a clashing event. So just, just sharing that with you. So, so we had a group of people that were that, that were uh, people of outstanding qualities. So Soro Ramaphosa is working in a different context. He's working with a, an, an ANC leadership that is a mixed bag, a mixed bag, which was the outcome of a conference held uh, about a year and a half ago. And so um, the, 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 you know, it's not for me at this stage to say who are the goodies and who are the baddies, but clearly there are people sitting in the national leadership uh, structure of the ANC who were not only supporters of, of Zuma and state capture, but were active participants in that. Some of them at some point will probably go to jail, but the wheels of justice turn quite slowly. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, these processes are unfolding and we have a leadership with people sitting on that leadership structure who really don't enjoy respect of society as a whole. And it does mean that Sol Ramaphosa himself is constrained because he's not a dictator. He's not a dictator within his own party, nor is he in cabinet. And so, you know, he, he has to get some kind of a consensus from the leadership structures, if you like. He can't just do whatever he likes. He can influence and he can, he can exert a positive influence, but at the end of the day, decisions taken are not his decisions alone. Uh, so, so I do believe we have a, a person of outstanding ability, a person of integrity, in a very different context, who is somewhat restrained by the realities around him. Yeah, sounds uh, great. I, I think that sounds great. Um, maybe Walter, we could should bring in Horst now. Yeah, I think so. And yeah. after then, we can uh, address the issue of eco economy and and what brings yeah. us out of the situation today. Yeah, yeah. Um, Walter. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, may, 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 may I say something about the economy while we're waiting? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, sure. <laughs> so you mentioned the the um, recession that we're in and uh, and the uh, economic challenges that we face and they they're real and they're huge. It's not that we were on a very strong footing uh, before the commencement of the coronavirus of this pandemic. We weren't. Uh, but of course, you know, it's got, it's got, it's, it's, it's a, in, in a very, the economy is in a, in a crisis at the moment. 
However, it's it's not worse than the eurozone, for example. I mean, I, I believe that the the average economic decline in the eurozone is actually higher than South Africa's uh, predicted uh, decline over the next few years. The global decline, it's, it's also a reality. If it weren't for China, the global decline would be much higher. China is also declining, but not as much as other countries. So um, what, what, what this has uh, managed to achieve, um, and I agree with Nikki when he speaks about, you know, we, we really have to reflect honestly on, on what we've done wrong, what we've failed to address, and as we move forward, to say it can't be business as usual, we've got, to, we've got to be much more determined and much more serious about as the economy grows, um, that it grows in a different way, that it's a much more inclusive growth, um, that uh, we, we know it's, it's kind of, even for those who just want our economy to be on a better footing and our economy to grow, I think everyone realizes that there's no sustainable growth of the economy unless we deal with the problems of poverty and inequality. So, so I think that's, there's a broad acceptance of that. And, 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 and things are being considered now, steps are being considered now uh, with the support of business and labor. So I think there's, there's a growing, um, because of the crisis and the nature of the crisis and extent of the crisis, the bringing together of business, labor, government, I think it's, there always have been fora for this, but I think the fora are tackling this jointly in a much more serious way. So, um, you know, new interventions, for example, the introduction of a basic income grant that everybody who is currently not getting an old age pension or a disability grant and that fall within the cracks that everybody would get some kind of grant from government. Question always, where will the money come from? But, mm -hmm. but the, the good thing is that the determination is there that you know, we, we simply have to find the money for some of these things. And that the, the business community working quite, quite closely with, with labor has, and with government have, have looked at, and then, and then government itself and the ANC have looked at a new kind of recovery package to say, what are the things that we can do to get our economy uh, going again and growing again? And some very good ideas are emerging question is always, well, okay, so you need government to invest, invest in infrastructure um, for economic growth to happen. You need investment. Where's the investment going to come from? These questions are real and we can't necessarily expect them to come from Austria or, or from any other countries because the money isn't there either. So it's difficult to, to get um, uh, funds to come to your country to help stimulate that growth. However, there are huge amounts of money in our country, trillions of rands, that could potentially be used to stimulate economic growth. But you need the consensus. A lot of them are in pension funds, are in, in investment, in, in, in asset funds, if you like. And so um, the, the question is getting them, getting money that is not government money because the budget is going to be severely constrained to be able to unlock some of the money that is there to invest in um, successful infrastructure projects and things that will have a, 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 an earlier impact on getting the economy going again. So all of our business, our big national business associations have merged, are working together in something called Business for South Africa, developing some really good plans and working closely with the presidency um, to, to, to move on to um, tackling some of the things that could yield quite quick results. Uh, and most of that lies in the form of investing in certain kinds of infrastructure that are desperately needed, but will have a, the effect of employing people and stimulating other forms of economic development. But to do this, to do these things without uh, getting ourselves deeper into debt by addressing some of the social realities is, 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 is a non-starter anymore. So there's an acceptance that although our debt levels are way above what they, what, what they would have been predicted earlier on, um, that even if we have to get deeper in debt, we don't have a choice. And that's where Nikki is right. It's been a, a period of, of serious reflection where it's been staring us in the face more than normally. And uh, so, so we will have to do things and will do things that otherwise we'd have said, no, we can't afford it. And now there's the, the, I think the discourse at the moment or the, the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the parameter, the, the, the um, uh, guiding principle at the moment is, can we afford not to do a thing rather than can we afford to do it? 
Okay, thank you very much. I think some of these points we have to take up and clarify a little bit more. But can we now, uh, 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 Marcel is... Yeah, it, it should work now. It should work. Okay. So let's, let's come uh, home. Already introduced yourself earlier. Could you give us your opinion on whether uh, Nelson Mandela's legacy is still significant for South Africa today? And in which area you think uh, his impact or his influence would be needed most? Well, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. And thank you to Sadok for inviting me. Last year this time, I was pleased to join you at the Mandela Platz in Vienna. I'm sorry, I can't be with you today. Um, to Sadok, I want to say you and your roots in the anti-apartheid movement enjoy a special place in the hearts of South Africans. Your continuous support and solidarity with the people of South Africa. You were with us and fought for our freedom and we thank you for being our friends and expressing international solidarity to this day. It's in fact a friendship that goes back 40 years. Before I speak, to the Nelson Mandela subject, I would like to say a word about Zinzi Mandela, the daughter of Winnie and Nelson. She died this past Monday morning, aged 59, uh, due to being infected with COVID virus, in fact. Zinzi occupies her own just place in the liberation struggle. She was born into the struggle and hardly knew her father and on many occasions, she and her older sister Zaini were without both parents because Winnie arrests and detentions and then internal exile, besides the father being in prison. Zinzi became a foremost courageous activist as a teenager, often being the mouthpiece of her father and her mother. Her courage um, <clears throat> deserves all our applause. Also at this very sad time, I feel obliged to make mention of her, not least because on the 14th of October, 1974, Winnie was sentenced to six months imprisonment. And I was one of the few people in court with her and she nominated me as Zinzi and Zaini's legal guardian because they at the time being only 13 and 15 in the law required this. We did what we could for the two girls them being forced to reside in the black area and us of course being only able to reside in a white area. We could only have them visit us in the daytime and we were indeed denied permits to visit Soweto where they resided. On the 21st of September, the same year, 1974, my own daughter was born and we called her Zinzi on um, Winnie Mandela's prompting. This is my, uh, deep and treasured a connection to the Mandelas. But now to today's subject. My comments are in the affirmative and I offer the following thoughts. Colonial and apartheid rule robbed us of many good, capable, moral and far-sighted leaders. And as a young democracy and as a nation, we need such. And we have Nelson Mandela as the few who persisted and uh, is our icon to this day. By this I mean that we need his compassionate humanity, his courage to speak out against conformity and conservatism that today shapes the ruling party. By this I mean his authority to put an end to the pervasive corruption that continues to cripple the development of our country. And by this, I mean someone who can resolute white racism. And by this, I mean to tackle the land question head on with sensible, with constitutional, and also, but with substantial parameters. And by this, I mean the leadership that it takes to tackle our crumbling and fumbling state administrative institutions. By this I mean 
insistence that ANC members of parliament perform and don't ditch their oversight role. And by, it, by this, I also mean a leader who could personally take charge of our dismally failed education system. By it, I mean a leader who speaks directly to South Africa being the most unequal country in the world and getting worse. By this, I mean someone who leads the discussion that for equality to happen, the rich need to give or shed something. By this, I mean someone who does not seek our economic salvation in the hollow term growth or endless infrastructure plans. By this, I mean an accountable democrat democratic, but also an uncomfortable and constantly challenging leader. Nelson Mandela could have been the leader who took South Africa into what we would call a CODESA negotiations that pick up on all that CODESA won, could not or did not deal with prior to 1994. Nelson Mandela's leadership would be significant today also in the global stage. Nelson Mandela would, with authority and influence, be able to speak out against the USA aggression at the, uh, on the global seas, on the war mongering against China, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, and others. Nelson Mandela would carve a place in the international diplomacy for Africa to attain an influential and equal place. Nelson Mandela could reassert the role of the United Nations in the face of President Trump trashing, negotiated, and finely tuned international cooperation. Nelson Mandela would speak against the USA dismantling the carefully brokered, also known deal as the Iran nuclear deal. His leadership set a standard and an example that still stands unparalleled in today's South Africa. Without sentimentality or nostalgia, we should take all that Nelson Mandela gave us. This means facing up to the especially tough, difficult issues that face us. I hope that he would also have had the wisdom and the humility to admit when and where he made mistakes and to do what it takes to correct such mistakes. Nelson Mandela stands, stands as a guide for all South Africans, not only for the ruling party. His impetus is a challenge to all, us, all of us in South Africa, and we are in dire need of people to pick up his baton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Horst, uh, for this wide-ranging and really thought-provoking uh, statement because we might not have the opportunity later again to have you participating in the discussion because of the uh, power outages. Can I just ask you one more question? Um, Nelson, Mandela, Nelson Mandela was probably unique as, as, a, as a political leader and as a human being. And... Uh, one should not expect that now, out of a sudden, many more Mandelas would, would appear on the, on the political scene in South Africa and beyond. But are you optim optimistic that some of these um, Mandela's uh, qualities will be felt in South Africa over the next couple of years? I am... I am definitely optimistic. I think that we can prevail, but we must also face the fact that um, even with our best efforts, the economy and the threat to democracy will be very powerful in the period ahead. But we will come through this. There is a future for us, I have absolutely no doubt. Before we go to the audience and uh, to take them in, I was in, in um, Johannesburg two years ago for the 100th birthday of, of uh, Madiba, and there um, I talked to Selo Hatan, the, the CIO of the Mandela Foundation. And you know, the, the nicest thing I found, there was the, um, the big hall with all the 
uh, videos and everything Mandela did and what he wrote. And then there was a, a pin board and there were post-its from, from uh, little children. Yeah. And they, they asked so funny questions. Yeah. And, and some were, um, uh, um, they are grateful what Mandela did for them and and but the funniest was and then um, uh, they said always dear Mandela dear Mandela why did you make uh, Czechos Fuma the president of this country and then they asked dear Mandela um, um, democracy is dying of course that was the Suma years can you help <laughs> and then this reminded me uh, the international thing then there was one that said uh, dear Mandela uh, could you please come back to life and replace Donald Trump as US president and I, I think that's that's <laughs> that's the thing the good leadership is on a global scale we have uh, we have uh, Donald Trump we have Bolsonaro we are really missing uh, persons like Mandela. So maybe from the audience, do you want to ask mm -hmm. questions? Let, let, let me just mention that there are a few questions on the chat, which we have ah, received, okay. and we make sure that they will be answered in the course mm -hmm. of uh, the, the discussion. Yes, Eric. Already. Well, thanks to uh, to the organizers and all of the participants. Um, I yeah, I, I enjoyed this a lot. Um, very thought provoking. Um, and one question I have, and I think it's more or less directed to all of the participants, is regarding um, the another part of legacy of Mandela that we haven't talked about so much to this point, which is the the international legacy. Um, the way I see it, Mandela, both during his time um, in exile and then in prison, as well as later as president, was also in bringing together various actors from the region and globally and connecting the ANC to to uh, various um, to various uh, organizations, governments, individuals, and so on. And so I'd be interested in um, in the international dimension of the crisis today now, and what would be the meaning of leadership in regional and and global terms internationally here, and what is there that we might might draw from Mandela's legacy in that sense, because um, he was really being respected across the ideological spectrum, was becoming also iconic in in much of a sense. So um, yeah, what could be the legacy in, in that sense, that would be my question. Okay. Um, can I can I try and, and respond to that? And, and I'm sure Derek would have to say something. I think from the comments we've heard from Horst and to some extent from Derek, is that we, we won't have another Mandela. And so at the one level, we, we can't yearn, as it were, for the return of Mandela. And the best we can do is, in a sense, to, to take the lessons of his life and see how they become internalized in terms of how we live and in terms of, of our politics. So to that extent, I think we must disavow ourselves of the notion that there could be another Mandela. But having said that, the, the kind of leadership that Mandela demonstrated regionally in ensuring that South Africa and Africa was able to take its place in the international community, in pushing for reform uh, at the level of the United Nations as well, to ensure that the developing world, as it were, at least had a greater voice in the affairs and the decisions of the international community, were to a large extent neglected for a long time post Mandela. But I think in, in the current leadership, we have in the stature of our president, someone who is able to at least command the level of respect, not at the same level as, as Nelson Mandela. And, and maybe it's absolutely unfair to him to begin to compare as it were, what he's able to do with what a Mandela would have been able to do. Uh, and that's the trap we often fall into. Uh, and that puts enormous pressure uh, on, on people. But, but he's able to command, as it were, that level of respect and to speak with, with that level of principle uh, in the international community 
and who's taken strong positions, for example, on South Africa's relationship, just by way of example, with Israel, uh, against, as it were, strong voices in the international community. So I think there's much to build on in, in that regard. Uh, and I think that legacy of Mandela uh, in how we shaped our foreign policy also was neglected for a long time. I mean, we, we had uh, people who were accused of gross human rights violations and crimes against humanity being allowed to come into South Africa. Uh, that was shameful to say the least and the courts pronounced on that. And it's, it's that kind of moral high ground that we must be able to retake and, and reclaim. And I think at the current time, there, there appears to be a groundswell that we've lost to some extent that position um, and that we need to regain that, just not for the sake of the position we take vis-a-vis -vis other countries, but in terms of our own integrity and, and our own commitment to who we stand for as a country and how we show solidarity and support for others across the world. So I, I think there might be a change in the tide as well. Yeah, um, I, I think what, what is a relief to us in South Africa is that we, we have a head of state. And uh, you know, there's been this vacuum to say the least and, and to say the worst in embarrassment for a period of years. Um, and now we, we have a person who's able to occupy that position um, intellectually and doesn't have this uh, shadow over his head of, of being possibly corrupt or guilty of some kind of malpractice. So, um, you know, he's, he's able to occupy the international stage and enjoy respect in doing so, as in the current president, Sol Ramaphosa. Um, clearly, somebody like, like um, Cyril is, is also the product, and, and many others, are the product of Nelson Mandela and that generation. And there's, there's always this pressure in South Africa, amongst many of us at least, to say, are we living up to their expectations? Um, you know, and, and, and that question will always be asked. And it is, in a, in a way, uh, a reference point. And I think it's a very good reference point. But the fact of the matter is we, we do have a, a head of state now who can engage meaningfully and with integrity and with some kind of trust and confidence with fellow members of st uh, heads of state around the world. The Nelson Mandela occupied a position not only in South Africa, but internationally, that um, no, one did it, no one else did at the time and no one else is likely to be able to occupy that kind of position very soon in the future. So he could phone Bill Clinton any time of the night and Bill Clinton would take his call. And so would any other head of state and they were like almost, you know, flattered. They were honored to be able to have the opportunity to speak to him. But he was, you know, a, a sort of a, a case on his own. There, there's, no, there's no matching and there's no attempt to, we, 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 sh we can't, we can't get a repeat of that. Um, Tabu Mbeki, uh, who followed Nelson Mandela as president, um, you know, also had the intellect, also had no uh, allegations of corruption on him, and certainly took the African uh, renewal and, and the challenges of the African continent and by promoting the African Renaissance, he took that very seriously. So in many ways, certainly around the African continent, he was highly respected, but he did have the, the shadow of his response to HIV AIDS hanging over him. And I think that was a, that was a big negative. The, um, then uh, for a very short period, there was uh, Khalima Moklante, and then came the Jacob Zuma era. And the Jacob Zuma, in the beginning, uh, he also came with struggle credentials. He also spent 10 years on Robben Island. And in, in many ways, a very affable person, a very likable person. And in the beginning, frankly, many, many South Africans uh, were, were, were um, who no longer feel that way, uh, were giving him the benefit of the doubt. So if there were some, you know, doubts about his suitability, um, you know, people saw, saw qualities in him and, and they were able to, they would say, well, let's give him a chance. And the, of course, then over the years that, that confidence level just declined. And, and back to where I was early on, uh, thankfully, we've moved out of that area, era and we now do have a head of state that can engage meaningfully with some kind of trust with fellow heads of state around the world.
Maybe we take another question and then I bring in some of the questions from the chat, if, if that is yeah. acceptable. If, if there is another question. Oh, oh. Just, just take the, the chat. Now, uh, because there was both of, of Derek and Jody spoke about the, the, the current president and the leadership he provides. And it was also said that he is constrained by uh, some other forces. And one, one question which is interesting from the chat says, uh, isn't he working with a mixed bag? Because it could, uh, and I, I understand it like, couldn't he have uh, done more in, in, in shaping his cabinet, bring in more prominent people who are on the uh, reform or the, the democratic side? So how big are the constraints really? Or, or could there have been more? I mean, I don't know. this is of course very difficult to, to assess from outside, but <laughs> maybe some some indications. Um, maybe I could start on, on that one, um, if that's okay. Sure. That's okay, okay. Um, and of course there, there are a series of questions that are in the chat group and we are time, time constrained as well. And some of them we can just give very quick answers to. But this is the question that you're asking now, Walter, is, is, is one of the questions. Well, um, I think it's, it's, what is required is an understanding of how things work in the ANC itself. So, so even during the time of Nelson Mandela, where he may have got away with uh, doing things um, that did not necessarily enjoy the support of some of his colleagues because of the stature that he enjoyed. The, but even he was very sensitive to you know, the, the collective that he was part of. Um, I think with, with the, now in the sort of Ramaphosa era, if you like, um, you know, the constraint and the, the practice is that who, 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 whoever is leading cabinet and whoever is on cabinet has to carry out the policies of the ruling party and the policies that are largely determined at national conferences and, and earlier policy documents going right back to the Freedom Charter, if you like. But the, so those conference resolutions are by and large binding Although, you know, obviously there can be responses and adjustments according to changed circumstances. They are a reference point. The, um, and then in the appointment of people to cabinet, um, there is no way that any of the presidents with the, e even Nelson Mandela, would have proceeded with the appointment of cabinet members without uh, ag agreement of their uh, fellow leaders, if you like, and we call them the the top six in the ANC, the office bearers of the ANC. So it's not, to, you know, although he has the constitutional right to appoint a cabinet of his choice, uh, the practice is uh, very firmly that he would consult not only with his, uh, the five other mem office bearers of the ANC, but they would even in his case, broaden the discussion and, and, have, and, and include the trade union federation and include the South African Communist Party in some of that discussion. So uh, you will see the mixed bag that we have with some very good ministers um, will always, or as it stands at the moment in South Africa, they are members of the South African Communist Party that, that are part of cabinet. Um, they are people who come from a COSATU base that enjoy the strong support of COSATU and, uh, and they make up cabinet. There are people there because of the factionalism that developed in the ANC in his attempt, in Sir Ramaphosa's attempt to, to build a, a kind of a unity and rebuild unity, uh, I don't think he had much choice but to, to make sure that in his appointments, he would be seen to be even-handed and not favor um, the, those that supported him pre-conference only. And so in other words, accommodate people, even those that he may not have the greatest confidence in. He would never say that himself, of course not. He has to express his fullest confidence in the cabinet, but there are people that would have um, uh, not have wanted him as, as president. Interestingly, I think a lot, lot of those people since the ANC conference um, a year and a half ago, um, you know, have increasingly 
um, accepted his leadership. And so things are shifting in South Africa and he is consolidating his position as president of the African National Congress. But, you know, there's still, it, there are still many who would like to see him fall, basically. So it's, it's not an easy task. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, just, can, can I? Uh, yeah. Let us be a bit brief, more brief. So. To, okay. We, yeah. Sorry for. S sorry, Walter. I, I, I agree largely with, with with Derek, but I think many people then ask the question uh, as to the constraints that that places on on the leadership in terms of taking South Africa to where it wants to go, and I think we have to be quite honest that that South Africans are people of great goodwill. I mean, the transition was an example of that. And even though what happened during the last 10 years or so um, is, is often spoken about, people don't forget that what happened happened really under an ANC government. And, and while one could point to the leadership at the top, it, it happened really under an ANC government who must take collective responsibility at some level for that, but also must take the credit for moving us out of that. So as it were, that same government has been given a second chance and it's a second chance that they, they dare not fail it. And therein lies the challenge because the constraints of the leadership to, to take us in the direction we have to go is felt quite, quite clearly from time to time. And notwithstanding the kind of leadership qualities we see in our president, one, one is able to see the, the stress of having to function under those constraints. And one, one's confidence in, in the future can't be too romantic as well. It has to be realistic. And that realism must mean that he may not be able to do all that is necessary, but perhaps if he's able to do sufficiently enough to take us along, then we would have done okay. Um, thank you very much. I see uh, Ilse Hanak. Uh, did you want to come in with a question? If it's possible, I would like to know if somebody is informed about the situation in Namibia concerning the corona uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we put the question on Namibia to a later stage, please? Yes, of course. But, yeah. yeah, it is yeah. very important also to me. And I think we have some specialists on Namibia amongst us. But now, can we follow up the, the, the situation in South Africa first? Yeah. And yeah. there was, I mean, a number of, of speakers raised the issue of inequality. And there's also one question from the, from the chat. Uh, because what comes next or what brings us out of the crisis? Uh, Derek Hanekom said we need a lot of money, trillions of rent, which is certainly true. Uh, we have to uh, get indebted more than we wanted to. So my question is, uh, is it only a question of money or is it not also a question of redistribution of wealth existing? And another question, which is from the chat, says, uh, can we expect the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank uh, to raise money for a, 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 a program to reduce inequality? Or are they not rather interested in maintaining inequality? So I think can we, that is the economy issue and the issue of persistent inequalities. And uh, can the new normality in South Africa uh, do something to, to reduce inequalities? Uh, is that only needing money or what policy measures have to be taken? And can we expect the international community uh, to agree to such a policy? I mean, the early policy documents of, of the, the ANC are very clear and they still are clear um, that we speak about growth and redistribution. Um, the National Development Plan, growth and redistribution, talk about inclusive growth of our economy. And I think that's where, to some extent, it has been that. 
and I'll touch in a moment why, you know, only, only some extent. So while the, uh, but um, this question, uh, Walter, about, you know, is it just growth or is it redistribution? Well, you know, if we, if we just redistribute the money that we currently have, we will never be able to do everything we want to do and that we need to do. So we have to have growth in order to reach the millions of people that we have to reach. At the moment, we've got something like 17 million people on some kind of social grant. So, I mean, that's, and, and most uh, developing countries and countries in Africa, very few of them have the kinds of social grants that we have. And that, of course, has brought relief to many people who have no other source of income. So that has made a critical difference in this period. The difference, the, the, the problem is, and that's related to the inequality, is that the very, very high level of unemployment. So the, the low the low job creating nature of the growth that we've had over the last few years, apart from the fact that the growth was insufficient. So we, we need more, more growth of the economy, but we need a more job creating growth uh, because clearly, I mean, we, we can't, you know, if the money is not available, we can't put more people on social grants uh, because we will get ever deeper into debt and then our debt servicing is going to take more and more of, of our, of uh, the money on, on our fiscus. So, we, we, we have to ensure that the economy grows, but we have to ensure that um, as many jobs as possible are created in the course of this economic growth so that the, the redistribution doesn't only happen in the form of, well, some people call, call them a little bit disparagingly, call them handouts. I think they're very, they're very important interventions and, and instruments of the state to bring relief, but it can't only be in the form of social grants. Mm. People have to be able to earn their own money, have have um, sort of the dignity of a job. And so that becomes one of our big challenges on the IMF. So clearly we, 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 we will need money to, to invest in, even invest in job creating projects, if you like. And um, the, the sources of, of that money, and I know the question was asked somewhere on the, chat, on the chats about the pension fund and the IMF. So they're, they're, you know, at the moment we've been downgraded by the rating agencies. So um, money that we borrow, and clearly we borrow money and we, have to, we will have to borrow more money, uh, but the borrowing becomes more expensive. So the IMF loan is, is, is uh, one that we've agreed to take. We don't take these loans, um, and then of course the BRICS Bank, the New Development Bank, we don't, we don't take these loans lightly because with, within our party, there's a deep cynicism about you know, the IMF and the role that the IMF has played over the years and the conditionalities that may come along with these loans. So we are very clear that, um, and, and we've, we've discussed that at the National Executive Committee level of the ANC, to say you know, we, we, we must engage robustly and ensure that there aren't conditions attached to these loans which are unacceptable, and many people use the word uh, the, our, our sovereignty mustn't be um, a threat, if you like. So we're very clear about that. But as it stands at the moment, these IMF loans are not uh, loans that come with all sorts of uh, um, uh, sort of uh, demands that are unacceptable to us. They, 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 they're loans that are available in response to the crisis that we're facing at the moment. Clearly, the, the BRICS, the, the New Development Bank, similarly, and then there are other banks. But the, the big source of potential investment finance in our country um, is, is not those loans. It lies in unlocking the pension funds. The government uh, pension fund alone, I, I really forget the figure, but um, Jody, maybe you can help, but it's something like 3 trillion rand in, in that, in that uh, or certainly more than 2 trillion rand in that fund alone. And that is government pensioners. So, uh, but in order to, to get that money to invest in some of the real things that will help stimulate the economy, um, the, those pension funds are, are owned by the, uh, the, 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 the beneficiaries of the fund and their representatives, if you like. And so you'd have to get consensus there, but it's moving in that direction where people realize that you know, money will have to be found and um, the, 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 the real challenge is to minimize the risk because you don't want to put uh, people's pension funds at risk. Uh, but, to, to, but I think there's, a grow, there's an acceptance that we will have to mobilize those sources of finance in order to, to get the necessary stimulation to our economy. 
Just a very quick one, Walter, because you, you mentioned Namibia, but it's so quick. The numbers of cases in Namibia are very, very small for a variety of reasons. They don't have the huge informal settlements that we have in South Africa with literally hundreds of thousands of people living in incredibly overcrowded conditions. Very, very difficult to contain the virus in South Africa. And even the whole debate about going to school or not going to school, a child at school in South Africa could be a child who lives in a house with, where three families are gathered in a very small house or has to go down a little lane amongst many houses to get just to get to a toilet. So the situation in South Africa is, lends itself to um, massive spreading of this virus. In Namibia, the cases are really very small. So Namibia has largely escaped the, uh, the full extent of this pandemic. Um, I understand that Jody Colopin has to leave us urgently. Is there anything you want as a final? Thank, thank you, Walter. I, I have to be somewhere, but I, I agree with, with largely what Derek has said, and the pension funds provide an, an enormous source of potential um, money to, to fund some of the projects that are necessary. But there's a, a fair level of anxiety and concern about about that and it's it's largely based on what I would call the deficit of trust that currently exists the level of trust that people need to have that if government is to utilize those funds it will be well used and even though we have good leadership I, I think we if one has regard to the Mandela legacy what is currently lacking is the is the level of trust that a democracy needs to have and that its citizens need to have in its leadership and that that deficit needs to be dealt with. Uh, then just before I, I leave, there was one question around gender-based violence and who are the victims and, and largely it's women and children, but it's not a new phenomena. Um, it has surfaced quite sharply again during the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we're going through, but it's been something historic and something that as South Africans, we grapple to deal with. We spend billions of rands in education, in public awareness campaigns, in improving the criminal justice system. But frankly, there's something seriously wrong in the psyche of South Africans that, that allow us to continue on this level of gender-based violence. And even sociologists have battled to provide us with, with the answers as to, as to why men can be as brutal as they are towards women and, and towards young children. But the extent of gender-based violence also extends to gays and lesbians and it's it's part of the intolerance we have so we have a wonderful constitution but the constitution in itself can't change the hearts and minds of people that that takes time and the socialization and south africa is a very violent society in all respects just not the institutional violence that we experienced for hundreds of years uh, but but also the violence caused by poverty and by dispossession and so we we must grapple with with, in a sense, this wonderful constitution that has been pasted over, as it were, a society that, that is beset by deep-seated problems. But having said that, I think we have this wonderful legacy that we can tap into and that we can try and internalize, and it can give us strength and comfort and provide us with the important indicators as to how we proceed. And just before I go, I'd like to thank you again, Walter, I've been invited by Sadok on, on two occasions to visit Austria as well, in both were wonderful occasions. They were spanned over 20 years, where I did a lecture in 95 and then went on a lecture tour in 2015. And it was, it was fascinating what I said in 95 and what I said in 2015. Uh, the 95 was, I think, the romantic part that I spoke about earlier, about this wonderful rainbow nation. And in 2015, it was a, it was a bit more realistic assessment of where we were after 20 years. So I want to thank you for the wonderful friendship, for the people of Austria uh, who have uh, expressed a continuing and ongoing interest in our well-being in where we go to as a, as a I mean, just the participants on this, on this webinar is, is an indication of that. And just to, to, at a personal level, say thank you to you, Walter, and to my friend, Robert, who was my um, uh, chaperone, if I could call it that. Walter was, was uh, afraid, Derek, that I might get into mischief. So he sent Robert along with me to make sure that I kept to the straight and narrow. So thank you very much. And thank you for having me this afternoon. Thank you for participating now. And uh, you were most welcome. You will be welcome as well as Derek Hanekom hopefully will finally realize the long planned private visit to Austria. Okay, thank you. So. <laughs>
Thank I you, Walter. Said that, thank you for participating, Jordi. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye. everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Yeah. I think we, we should slowly but surely come to the end of our webinar. Uh, there's one question, uh, uh, there's many questions left, but one new topic, actually, the education. Uh, maybe could we briefly t- uh, comment on, edu- on the state of education in South Africa? Uh, and then uh, uh, we come to our to the conclusion. There's two pictures actually we want to show participants before we close. But on education, uh, Derek, you are not an uh, you are not minister of education, but I'm sure you have a lot of things to say on the state of education. Um, I dare say there are some of your participants who possibly know more about it than I do, but. Um, <laughs> The, you know, I mean, at the moment, the, I mean, we, we know that the legacy of the apartheid period of, was felt perhaps more in um, the neglect of education of the majority of our people than any other area. And to, to kind of remedy that was one of our biggest challenges. And so um, I would accept the argument that um, over, the, over the years, insufficient progress. So. I mean, very good developments. And um, yeah, at a time when I was also the Minister of Science and Technology, many, you know, very sort of inspiring young kids going through the system, etc. But many, many others who, who just, you know, aren't able to get through their, their, their schooling um, or are still provided with um, a kind of the lower, lower quality of education, not the kind of education that we would like to see. Uh, so we, we still are we still have a very big challenge at the moment the the big debate as in many other countries and we we touched on that earlier on is whether you know whether kids should go back to school whether students should go back to universities if so if if so which and under which conditions so at the moment it's um the you know it's not that everyone is returning to schools at certain grades the, but the debate is 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 raging in south africa especially with the the last few weeks with the pickup of the pandemic, if you like, and the spike. And so, uh, you know, the question is an open-ended question whether um, schools should just be shut down for a period for, for everyone. At the moment, the including the the, um, the union and education are saying, well, at least allow the matriculants to write their matric. Um, the intention was to get the grade 11 stand, and I think the grade um, Sixes, I, I can't, can't quite remember to be able to go back to school, um, but the it's it's all open ended at the moment. Uh, as I said, it's not an easy one for us to answer because yes, um, the you know the, the the unfortunately it's going to a school um, doesn't mean going to a school with twenty people in the classroom. It's often going to a school with fifty or sixty people in the classroom. It's going to school sometimes without decent sanitation, although a lot of progress has been made in this regard, insufficient progress. Once again, insufficient progress. So, um, so but, but yet, as I said earlier, Walter, uh, the hard reality for many of the kids who are quite keen on going back, two, two hard questions. Uh, the kids who are very keen on going back to school, um, are uh, many of them, might be better off at school where we have a daily food sc- uh, school feeding scheme for example and where you know there's some kind of monitoring they would have to wear masks in the school there's some kind of sanitation practice in the school and probably even getting the reinforcement of the message at school which they don't necessarily get at home that's the one part of it the other part of it is uh, you know uh, just getting yourself to the school is very difficult and it, it, it's 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 there's no easy answer to the question but uh, the Minister of Education has said a few times, uh, Angie Mochecha, that you know, if you have kids out of school for long enough, the chances of them never going back to school are very high. And I think that is a, a very big risk. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's what I have to offer on education. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Margit, do you want to say a final word um, before we come to, the, to our pictures? Yeah could do so. Um, uh, I think it was very, very interesting, uh, even if we talked more about the current problems uh, of of South Africa. um, I would maybe um, uh, 
want to, to say a word from Selo Hatang, I, I, I mentioned before from the uh, Mandela Foundation. Uh, he said uh, for the 100th birthday, he said we should be vigilant not to speak for Mandela because nobody, nobody knows what he would say today, but we uh, should continue building the land of his dreams. And I think uh, that's, um, that's a, a long way to go, but uh, still I love to hear that um, with all these problems, with all in inequality, with all these in education problems and everything, it's still South, South Africa and that's how I feel every time I, I, I go there. It's really a silly, resilient uh, a people. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good, it's people of goodwill, as somebody said. And uh, I hope you will come over all these problems and build the, the country of Mandela's dreams. Mm. Thank you very much. I think that is a good uh, closure of, of the webinar. Uh, building a country of Mandela's dreams uh, in South Africa, but globally, a, a world of okay. Mandela's dreams. And <laughs> well, one is actually not possible without the other, I would say. Uh, this webinar took place two days ahead of Nelson Mandela Day 2020. For those of you who are in Vienna, I would like to mention that uh, we will have a, a short and more symbolic uh, celebration of uh, Mandela Day on Saturday, three o'clock in the afternoon on Nelson Mandela Square in Vienna. Uh, also in other cities, uh, other parts of the country, there are some events or at least some, uh, something has been done to highlight Mandela in Austria. And uh, I think uh, Marcel is the best place to show us how Austria is beginning to look like. This is Vienna. Um, Derek Kanikom, if you come, we, we go together, we go to Nelson Mandela Platz to have a glass of red wine. All right. <laughs> but I mean, what really is a miracle uh, 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 took place in Salzburg. One of the most famous, most beautiful Baroque churches of Salzburg is now decorated with a banner reminding people of Nelson Mandela Day. And because there is no year written on the banner, I would assume that next year they will have the banner again. And I hope that Salzburg, uh, together with Vienna and other smaller towns, uh, will come on board to highlight Mandela Day each year. So you see that in Austria, we try to do, to, to, to make a, a little contribution at least to, to the legacy of Mandela and to, it's not about his person, personality, it is about the, the, the values he, he, he lived and, and the values which should be, into, should be put into political practice in South Africa, but as I said, uh, worldwide. So with that, I would like to thank, first of all, the South African panelists, which as it turned out was Derek Hanekom and Jody Kolopen. Thank you very much for taking the time and for doing a lot behind the scenes to overcome the electricity problem of other people. Uh, we regret, we, we had at least Horst Kleinschmidt present indirectly. Uh, we regret that Barbara Hogan was not able to join. Please communicate to her our best regards and gratitude for the principal will uh, to, to come to attend. I would also like to thank all participants um, who, who had a lot of questions. Some of them have been answered, but I think uh, many of them could be explored more in detail. And we will try in our lectures at Zadok in Vienna and in our magazine in Daba uh, to, uh, to get to these questions more in, more in detail. And finally, I would also thank the Afro-Asian Institute Salzburg and uh, Marcel in particular for the good hosting, uh, the, 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 the technical leadership you provided us with and which was crucial for 
uh, this webinar to come together. So thank you very much. Enjoy Saturday as International Nelson Mandela Day. Thank you. Thank you. So just, uh, it would be really um, unfortunate if I were not to add my voice to um, the other two speakers uh, ex expressing our appreciation. Again, the same as, as uh, Horst said for the contribution so many of you made. People that are not amongst the younger of you sitting here, but um, who are very active in the anti-apartheid movement. I think, you know, your, your efforts made a critical difference. Um, you know, the global effort to fight apartheid and we really appreciate that but the fact that you've just continued giving support is is very much appreciated by us um uh vielen dank danke schön um i spent walter you know i spent three months in salzburg many many years ago so i look forward to that social visit to vienna and all of these and i don't want virtual meetings when i'm in vienna i hope to meet every one of you when i'm <laughs> in vienna so uh, thanks thanks so much for organizing this and thank you to the participants sorry we we didn't have more engagement you know there's never enough time for this sort of yeah. thing but thank you to um, our facilitators and to you walter for organizing it thanks my pleasure thank you all of you and have a good evening